much for being with us today for this presentation. I'm really happy that you could join us, could join us virtually at least because we could not have you this year with us for uh, for various reasons. Uh, as we are late, I will not read anything from uh, from from what we have in the materials here in this space and immediately jump to the to the presentation. Uh, the the floor is, is completely yours. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for um having me here. It's it's strange not to be um not to be there because I've been um. Uh, always quite enthusiastic about uh, taking part in the in the summer school. So, um, considering that I am not present, I was I I was thinking about how to formulate the uh, the presentation that I want to give you today, and I wanted to start um, embodying a future because I think one of the main cruxes um, that I will be talking about in the in the in the um, in the seminar that I'm teaching next week is uh, the collapse of the future and what does it mean and what what has the future turned into so um as a little I I have then um as a way to launching into the future um a channeling on the, or an embodiment from a my my own persona in some 300 years time so with that here we go um, i come here with a letter that we wrote for you what do you want from us we are not like the lorax we don't speak for the trees you are dreaming of the future? Well, let me tell you a thing or two about dreams. Be careful of what you dream, because there are dreams that have nightmares stitched into them. The lining of first world dream futurities is stitched with the blood of many third world truncated presents. Do you know about inequality? Do you know who pays the price for your dreams? Excess output is the name that we give to the unexpected outcomes of a speculative design. Casualties that are not calculated in the original ideas, but nonetheless enter the culture and the social imaginary. One of the most obvious excess, excess outputs of the Cold War space race, for example, was space junk. But the, outputs, the excess output of your present looks different. It takes less material forms. Um, but however, what I can tell you right now is that the future is not the excess output of the present. In the logic of old media, temporality was color coded. 20th century Africa was black and white, just like Dickensian England. And Latin America was always fussy and oversaturated to the point of impossibility, like outdated, badly processed film. How did that work? One must remember that there are many temporalities in operation at all times. And that under colonial image rule, the third world present has always belonged to the first world past. In the diffuse world of post fordist economies, all matter was placed in permanent motion and all temporalities were spatialized. Online, every social form got to have a second life. Everything was an image and all images were up for grabs. The space race was revived as an extension of digital incorporation. But the fantasy of a cultural totality was full of cracks and the increasingly perv pervasive vectors of global communication were by far more chaotic than one would care to suggest. The digital frontier once carried the promise of a post-political condition free of agonism and struggle, an economy of abundance, instead of an economy of scarcity. But so far, this dream has been nothing but a, but a, weak, but a, but a weak utopia. The frictionless space of 
perfect technological reception is only a first world effect. And as we know, the conditions in which innovation is produced have nothing to do with the conditions into which it is deployed. And so when digital space became a territory in its own right, its mapping didn't happen with any kind of fidelity. The interests that try to describe this territory have never been concerned with either accuracy or diversity. And they have also not been interested in the imaginary. As we remember in old maps, unknown lands, blank spots, were often inhabited by fantastical beings, sea serpents, mermaids, um, talking feet, monstrous beasts. And however, in the most widely circulated maps of the virtual world, digital topographers have labored to create a homogeneous landscape where what we have is users and the user is a user is a user, wherever you place them. So there are no social or, cult or cultural accidents. There are no mermaids or talking serpents. And what you get is an endless horizon of IKEA furniture and unknowns that are always filled with replicas of the digital topographers themselves, whomever is dreaming up this world. Now, in a world that is constantly, in a, in a, in a world that has been dreamed by by these digital topographies, how do borders manifest? And it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because it's not just geographical. Man borders then manifest in the sandboxing of Apple devices, which prohibit the use of third-party apps and that penalize the jailbreaking of iPhones to the point that nobody jailbreaks their iPhone anymore. It also, they also manifest in China's internet policy, which determines the boundaries of Google. Um, a, a fantastic instance of digital borders, for example, was apparent in January, 2014 um, in Ukraine during the, May, the original uh, Maidan clashes, when cell phone users that happened to be near the Maidan clashes started to receive um, text messages saying, dear subscriber, um, you are registered as a participant in a mass riot. And this means that willingly or unwillingly, um, like in a China Miedil novel, these users happen to have crossed the border between the good and the bad Kiev. And this means that digital devices double as control mechanisms. Their production intricate, intricately dependent on the decimation of digitally underrepresented regions. Um, and by this, I mean that the production of digital um, devices is intrinsically dependent on extracting rare earths and minerals from whatever place they happen to be under, which surprisingly tends to be um, usually in the third world. And, and yes, we look for rare earths and underpaid labor. And as this new geography displaces the old, the digital subject becomes more visible than the physical subject. Um, and so while the circulation of celebrities, luxury goods, liberal professionals, tourists, and financial flows occupies the field of visibility, Refugees, seasonal workers, immigrants, and illegal aliens have been rendered invisible. And so what does the future look like for those lacking digital representation? And what does it look like for those who are overrepresented? What we could call those that are digitally obese. If the conditions under which you exist are too precarious for you to be considered a user in this new landscape, you may be destined for extinction or you may already be extinct, part of a barren obsolete present that will soon be discontinued. And so how do you experience other times? Strange fruit, a cargo boat glides across the water surface, smooth as a mirror. 
It's a sheep that ferries fresh, fresh exotic dreams, mostly grown in developing countries. Lychee and rambutan from Indonesia, Brazilian limes, dragon fruit from Vietnam, papayas, passion fruits, pineapples, bananas, all glowing below decks with the sun-kissed allure of the global south. Logistics experts from each country of origin must adhere to strict requirements to ensure that the pallets inside the reefer containers arrive at their destinations without malarial mosquitoes, without traces of corruption, without hunger, without civil wars that could ruin the fruit. New flavors satisfy increasing demands. No compromises can be accepted when it comes to hygiene. Temperatures must be controlled. Well, now is the time to tell you something that you already know. There is no future. I cannot point you towards anything. I cannot fulfill wicked utopias. And what I mean by this is that the future cannot be designed. It is not a territory that you can conquer and plunder. It is not a place from which you can take resources. It is not any kind of a space that can be approached colonially. Because if you try to do that, it would only hurt you at the end. What does it mean to say that? It means that the future is legion, that without imagining multiple exercises, any, any try, any exercise, any attempt at dreaming the future will be going nowhere. And yet your imaginative capacities are currently limited to the domain of capital. This limit is a defining characteristic of reimagining capital with any kind of horizon for real world application. Therefore, the question of post-temporal capital, of modes of escape, of new modes of capital, of the ultimate excess output, cannot be about real world application. Because any kind of real escape does not demand a new economic theory. It does not demand an ethical horizon. It has no political project. It doesn't even require oxygen or humans to survive. This may be depressing for those who demand a structural or ethical juridical horizon for political thought, not to mention for those who like to breathe. But let's see if we can manage not to get depressed yet. And yes, I know that you are looking for reassurance. That there has been a pandemic that brought everybody to their knees that there has been a standstill of empty seas, of empty airports, of planes that cannot fly, empty skies, full skies, empty skies and full airports. And the desire to go back to some kind of normal. And I hope that you know that you will not be go going back to normal once that this is over. Of course, things will become normalized. This is just the way the world works. Whatever things will be, whatever that normal will be. But there will not be going like anything like going back, because we can't. We don't move through time through time that way. We can't know what is what the future will be, and I think one one of the points of of uh, trying to speak as such is is trying to imagine the experience of, of constant death and how, how is that signal and how is that being read and what kind of imaginaries that produces. Um, and how to deal with it without having the temptation of constantly res resorting to the future, uh, but rather trying to stay in the present. And to think that if we don't have, the, the, I mean, we cannot produce the future without producing the present. So what are the presents that we want to, to look at? And I mean, uh, what are the presents that we want to have a future for? Um, and the most generative image that I have found to try to think about um, not even not possible futures, but possible presents is um, the image of the undead. This is something I have been working on for quite a while now. And um, when I think about the undead, I think um, not just about, well, 
let let me read some of something about on that before I launch into into more of that. Um, this would be um, yeah, perhaps as a response to the experience of collective death in multiple worlds, the on death hunt contemporary imaginaries and have become generative figures in the post humanities. Yeah. The undead swarm through a multitude of movies, graphic novels, and video games, functioning as funhouse mirrors that reflect different facets of the present human condition. Beyond the flat representations of the undead as digital others, as enemies that can be clicked away and wheeled away and killed without remorse on our smartphones, Xboxes, or um, armor drones. The living dead have complex underpinnings. They come in a variety of flavors, and it is perhaps helpful to look at what this variety is made of. Jeffrey Jerome Cohen writes that the monster is difference made flesh comes to dwell amongst us. And this idea of difference is useful if we try to think about homogenizing tendencies in the production of a singular future, right? And then once we think about that, surprisingly, the monsters are not so bad. But the undead are not so much monsters as they are foreboding constructs, embodiments of dark possibility, the fear and fascination we, fears, we, feel, we feel towards realities that could come to be. And Maybe to deal with that, what would be useful is to try to look at the meanings of the identities that are inhabited by the living dead. We have the classic undead, and the classic undead are the vampire, the ghost, and the zombie. And when we think about what these figures represent, I mean, vampires are pure seduction, right? The vampire is an incarnation of extractivism and, and capital immortal beings with superhuman like, strength that are fully eroticized, that have this incredibly sexy, sexy allure about making more of themselves. There is kind of like a blood fuel Ponzi scheme where a, a pyramid scheme where the vampire sort of like replicates, but it doesn't give anything back not even a reflection. If you put a vampire in front of a mirror, there's nothing back. So in a way, um, I could almost think that the vampire is a perfect, uh, not a perfect, but a, but a fairly accurate representation of capital, just like a black hole of hunger and desire and a really sexualized replication of that hunger and desire. Um, then there is a ghost and a ghost is, um, a spirit without a body, something that can be seen as the attenuated human, or I don't know, we can we can go back to that um, famous line that uh, a specter is haunting Europe, um, that we all know, I would say, um, and thinking um, that it's a, a ghost is like, a, it's a restless craving for temporalities that don't exist any longer or that can no longer be accessed. It's for us frustration, longing, howling, haunting. It's like, it's like a specter haunting a space, somebody hungry, but that cannot eat. The ghost wants to turn back the clock. It wants a return to former glory. It makes me think, the, the, the image of the ghost makes me think of um, Victorian literature of, uh, you know, like former novel characters haunting castles makes me think of American electoral campaigns of things like make America great again, uh, which was the slogan of uh, Donald Trump and build back better, which was the slogan of Joe Biden, which are um, both of those are incredibly nostalgic approaches. And the thing is that we can only build on what is ahead of us. And so the ghost howls, but time moves forward. And now we get to the third incarnation um, of undead, which is the zombie. Zombies are an unthinking and ravenous multitude, as opposed to the vampire and the ghost, which are extraordinary, 
the zombie is ordinary. Ghosts and vampires have individual desires and idiosyncrasies, but zombies are a collective. Zombies are never alone. They are legion. A multitude of bodies without agency, shells, husks, less than human. There are movies and novels that are, that are full with scenes of victims hypnotized, willingly offering up their necks to, run, to join the ranks of immortal vampires. It, there is a dance of seduction that goes into, into falling prey to a vampire. But zombie bites, however, are never sexy. It is hardly attractive to lose one's mind and sense of self while becoming infected with an uncontrollable rage. We know the names of our ghosts and vampires, but zombies never get a name. They inhabit an uncomfortable space of being disposable in death and probably also being disposable in life. Taken together, these figures of the undead invite us to reflect with a sense of horror about what the human has become. And here I'm trying to use horror as a generative um, concept. The undead herald a coming apocalypse, or perhaps a new era of post-human flourishing that is yet to come. Horror is a map of what we fear. And so as our unconscious anxieties are elevated to the forefront of consciousness, we can respond with fascination and gaulish delight. And in that sense, horror can offer catharsis in times of trouble and even open up wounds as it needs to be done in order to begin the process of healing. And so the undead play a big role in apocalyptic imaginaries. But I think that both horror movies, as well as the spin-offs for kids in things like Minecraft and so on, have lost sight of what is actually at stake in end time imaginings. And of course, and in end time imaginings, there is the question that is at the forefront is what happens with the future and, and who gets to tell the story at the end. And the thing is that many, when we think about end world imaginings and, and possible futures, what we need to remember is that many worlds have already ended. Indigenous and previously un enslaved peoples have long been living with apocalypse after terrifying encounters with inhuman monsters that yet were human. The undead have for a long time been crossing the threshold into the real world. Um, some images have crystallized in the last couple of years, horrific images of undead emerged during the pandemic. There were hundreds of restless bodies floating along the Ganges River in India. And there were also thousands of um, minks, if I'm not uh, mistaken, that, uh, that have to be, that were killed and then buried and then emerged from their graves as, as they were shallow and there were some, and those were like COVID infected minks that kept emerging from the ground, not only making manifest the goalish aspect of luxury good markets, because make no mistake, those minks existed to make coats. Um, but it, and they were a big source of COVID contagion in Europe. Um, meanwhile, in Siberia, as the permafrost has melted, 30,000 year old viruses that are still infections have been found amongst the methane fumes. Comfortable middle class lifestyles may well be under threat, but they are not uh, under threat from hordes of the hordes of people displaced by colonialism and capitalism or those that we could see as zombies. Violence is not the right response to the undead. Instead, what we need to think is um, what is what is on undead? What is what's the difference between death and undead? And what kind of commitments would we offer to intergenerational responsibility and care? And in order to open that up, let's think about, I mean, it's easy to look at the undead that are like us, meaning the some or that are uh, based 
uh, upon our image, like the zombie, the ghost, and the and the vampire. But there are also the undead that we have created. And when when talking about that, we are also talking about design and the undead being byproducts of design. Um, excess from the consumer culture that we have uh, generated that will outlive us with a relentless, the relentless haunting presence. All the novel entities that have been introduced into the world, isotopes, ghost nets, toxic spills, um, uh, radium isotopes with a half-life decay of uh, 1600 years that make buried bones um, glow in the dark. All, all, like everything that we have done to fossilize remains, the way in which we have we have uh, weaponized uh, oil deposits. Once upon a time, death was simply an intergenerational gift. Ecological communities were associations of predators and prey, omnivorous scavengers, parasites and hosts, were always dependent and have always depended on ongoing intergenerational cycles of life and death. Life is a brutal, life is a taker, death is a brutal gift of tenderness towards the future, let's say. And, the, and so the, the food web is premised on reciprocity among species, the species. But new kinds of undead entities, um, DDT, industrial poisons, have emerged with, the, with advanced capitalism. And so the catastrophe of modern progress has disrupted these regenerat this original regenerative processes. Piles of debris are still growing skyward with wreckage that is very, very slow to decay. Life and death have been uncoupled. And so the undead products of modernity are turning away from the living. Now, um, on apocalypse, like in, and this is like when we think about what is apocalypse and what is extinction, and which which one of those offers a more viable um, approach, let's say. And the thing, I mean, when it's it's hard to separate and delaminate the terms, but if we, if we think about apocalypse. It's always, apocalypse is an intensely human process that has a lot to do with judgment and with, with, with passing um, moral accounts and separating the good from the bad and so on. I mean, which I guess is possible to do when you are talking about humans, but it becomes more and more um, absurd if you start thinking about non-human entities. You know, how do you do that with giraffes? How do you do that with viruses? And and so maybe we try not to think so much about apocalypse, but about the different extinctions on the, of different presents and, and how to halt these processes or how to try to produce futures, not just not one, but the many. And the thing is that apocalypse signals um, giving up on the future instead of thinking that in order to try to imagine a future we need to commit to the difficult world, uh, to the very, very difficult work of composing better presence. This is on the words of Jeffrey Jerome Cohen. Instead of reveling in the horror of the apocalypse, Cohen suggests that we disentangle the undead from the nightmares about the end times. We can embrace the undead as generative figures that illustrate aspects of the world that are needy of care. And for this, recognizing how ourselves are becoming undead is an important first step. So as we can try to contemplate preparative work that is urgently needed. It is very easy to lumber along on thinking within a modern world that continues to generate wreckage in the name of progress. And so it is maybe time to think again, you know, how do we use design? How do we, uh, how do we use art? How do we use our skills to try to care um, for us as in, in our living and our future dying incarnation so that we don't become on death? We must rearticulate intergenerational cycles of life and death. 
it is important to advocate for responsibility in technology and in design. We must learn to create and make things that can die. And this is the crux of the presentation that I wanted to give. And I think now, I, because I cannot see you in the room, it would be probably interesting to see if we can try to open up some of these concepts and try to have a bit of a discussion. I don't hear you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, can you hear? Thank you so much, first of all, for your presentation. And I'm looking forward to the course uh, that you will do. And this is a nice introduction to, to the theme and to your exploration, your current exploration. I'm always happy to, to, hear, to see and hear where are you right now with your practice. And this, but the last question that you made, you know, how do you use our skills and art? We had the previous presentation more or less in the end, making the same question. Uh, I think it's, uh, it could be the first starting point for opening up the, the, the discussion not on your uh, on your presentation. So I'm just going to ask if anyone has any remarks or, or thoughts about what what uh, Julieta was presenting today, and then and then we can discuss more. So just just to clarify, so there's this position of the undead, of those who who cannot die, but they're also not alive. So at the end, you're saying the role of art is to allow then us things to be able to die yeah okay i'm just processing that as an idea is is there not an argument to organize politically as the undead you know do we need to pass away into this space or I mean, it reminds me, if, if we remained as the undead, it would be like Benjamin's idea of, of, of being, um, you know, the, the barbarian, of, of holding on to the uncomfortable and difficult space, rather than producing what could be a kind of culture of mourning and uh, could become sentimental in a way. So, is is there an argument to to hold on to the, the space between life and death and to operate within that or as that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, you know as we see things moving and as we see culture moving, right? It's it's not it's not realistic to advocate for a standstill or to say things when I was young, things were better, right? Or, you know, like, but when I was a child or let me tell you how it was in my time, of course, things have been, um, things have been different. And I think there is a mark, um, I mean, like the cycle gets really disrupted once we encounter full-on extractivism. It's a certain point of the 20th century. I mean, of course we have, um, Industrial Revolution and things took a very like a, uh, I mean like the balance of life and death changed radically there. But with full-on extractivism, it 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 really got affected, and with oil extraction and so on. And I mean, like, of course, what happens is that I mean, you know, once you think about it, about how much of our consumption is based on necropolitics, how much of our industrial world is necropolitics. And how much of our world is fueled by, by the death of entities and how much of our design is at the same, same time predicated in imagining a situation in which of like eternal life, eternal presence. So 
I mean, like, I keep trying to imagine, you know, like what it, what it would be um, the world if we think again. Okay, let, let me go back. There is, do, do you know what a whale fall is? Whale fall. So whale falls are um, when the body of a whale falls into the into the abysmal depths. It's so big that it becomes an ecosystem, and it feeds um, like a community of scavengers and predators and animals that live uh, in the sea bottom for up to sixty years. And it it really becomes an ecosystem. And I keep thinking about that kind of like incredibly brutal and tender gift towards life that like how did you become and and like this scene this war that we throw around so often like let's become this let's become that and it's like i, I keep looking or I, I look at those trees that fall in the forest and then all of a sudden you see again with more little trees growing inside of them and mushrooms and so on and it's like oh they are becoming i mean like that that's like the best instance of of, of what i'm becoming i can think of so I, I mean, like I keep trying to, I find that like the most elegant and effective way of ensuring a continuation of the world. And how can one translate that kind of um, approach in when design and um, has been actually predicated upon not engaging into that kind of transformation, when technology has been something that um, in the last hundred years, you know, like barbaric, barbaric primitive technologies are those that get reintegrated into the environment. So we build things up to the point that they cannot be reabsorbed. And then that is, the, that is progress. That's technology. It cannot be taken back. It stays somehow. So um, how I, I, so I think a lot about these things as matters of design, how to reconfigure design so that it can become so that it can actually not stay of its time but enter the future they can and in the only way for that is transformation and the only way for it to transform is to actually be able be pliable enough so that it can understand when its time has passed and then it you know like suddenly make the space for the next thing to come somehow I mean, that's where my mind is at these days. Thank you. Any other thoughts, ideas? Okay. Uh, we are running a bit late, so I know, uh, I know. I'm going to cut this here. But thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Looking forward to, to your course and to, to the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, this is uh, pretty much what the entire course is about, so. Thank you.